So, thank you very much, Helmut, for this introduction here. And I want to thank the organizers, the OCC, and especially Josiane and Bert Hong for inviting me and giving here my presentation actually at the last talk of this session because I'm dealing actually and I want to present you something about the real end product of protein oxidation. You heard a lot about protein oxidation already, carbonylation, uh, thyroid modification, and in the last discussion also I think from Kelvin was a question about protein aggregates. And I want to talk something about the protein uh, aggregates here. What is, before I start really with my talk, I was, want just to mention that protein oxidation is kind of special. It's not like a one hit that you have one radical, one oxidant, modifying once a protein, and this protein is then oxidized. It's very often a multiple step process. So you have several oxidations going on in a protein and all these different oxidations, this increase in oxidation and oxidation status of the protein might cause different effects. And eventually you modify a protein so actively that you have at the end um, a highly reactive protein which might aggregate because it's unfolded, because it has reactive uh, groups on the surface, it has um, hydroperoxides on it and so on. It was beautifully shown from Jan Gebitti from Australia that these hydroperoxide might be stable in proteins and react with other proteins and forming finally these cross-linked proteins. So, uh, cross-linked protein aggregates. So, you have seen this picture already from Kelvin's talk, so it's something like this, it's a different theme. In our cell, in the mammalian cells, you have a lot of different proteases. So the proteasomal system was mentioned already. We talked about mitochondria alone, and there are other proteases also in mitochondria. I want to mention a little bit today also lysosomal cassepsins, which is a group of proteins, more than 20 different proteins, sitting in the lysosomes and are essentially able to degrade a large amount of proteins very non-specifically. So, and you heard already two talks, I had great, uh, great introduction by two talks about that normal proteins get oxidized uh, during stresses. They might then be degraded by the 20S proteasome in the cytosol or in the nucleus. And of course, what I just want to mention here very briefly, the proteasome undergoes a number of regulatory steps. It's not just that it's induced and always function in the same way. There are, another, uh, there are a number of factors in the cell regulating the activity of the proteasomal system. And what I actually want to talk today about is normally the proteasome is degrading oxidized and unfolded proteins, but it's always degrading monomers. It's no aggregates, no aggregated proteins are degraded by the protein, proteasome. What happens to these protein aggregates? Eventually, a cell during aging, during acute stress, is so heavily damaged that the proteasome is not able to deal with all these oxidized proteins. And this is actually the cartoon here. Either this is degraded in time by the proteasome or it's staying there. And then, if you go back to the literature, there is this old-fashioned, it's hard to say old-fashioned, there's long-lasting effect in the literature on a material which is called lipofuscin, which is formed in aging cells, it's found in the organism, there's really uh, almost 170 years history of measurement and discovery of lipofuscin. However, there's some gap in the detection uh, or in the mechanism that we know about how these heavily oxidized cross-link proteins which are formed in the cytosol of the cell or in the mitochondria are processed that they form lipofuscin. And some 15, 20 years ago, Ulf Brunk and Alex Terman formed a theory which they called the lysosomal, uh, mitochondrial lysosomal theory of aging where they said, okay, macromolecules molecules are taking up into lysosomes. And there you have all these lysosomal enzymes. You have a radical process here due to the iron, which is taken up by the uh, from the mitochondria also. And you have especially the acidic pH, which is a major component of processing 
protein aggregates and macromolecules into the final product, which we know from pathology, which is lipofuscin. This is from one of their papers here. I, I'm afraid it's not well written here. It's in, from 2002 and a couple of years later. Uh, so they, they pointed out here that lipofuscin is only found in lysosomes. And a uh, couple of years later, they published another review-like article where they pointed out that by different means of uh, autophagic processes, uh, an autophagosome is formed, which is fusing with a primary ly uh, lysosome, again with an acidic pH. And this is formed finally then at the end, uh, the lipofuscin within the lysosomes. Uh, this theory was triggered actually by the observation that you find in cells most of the lipofuscin in lysosomes. So just by staining, you can always find it uh, over there. So today we know a little bit more about autophagy, how material is getting into the lysosomes. And I just want to make it very short. You have basically three processes. One is the microphagy, which is an uh, with, with an involvement of the lysosomal membrane, it's enclosing smaller parts uh, of the cytosol here. The other one is called the uh, macroautophagy or macrophagy, where a new membrane is growing in the cell, enclosing cellular organelles and parts of the cy uh, cytosol, uh, enclosing it in a so-called autophagosome, and then it's fusing with the lysosome. Or the other one, studied mainly by Anna Maria Coervo right now. It's a chaperone-mediated autophagy where a single substrate is transferred due to chaperones into the lysosomes LAMP2A, which is a transporter in the lysosomal membrane, is important here. Uh, and the protein is unfolded and transferred into the lysosome and then degraded. So if you think about it, the most likely process, which is involved in perhaps protein aggregate uptake into lysosomes is perhaps macrophagy. And we set up a system which we called the senescence-induced premature senescence, which was invented years before, uh, which is a permanent chronic exposure of cells to stresses. And as we learned from Bertrand's talk before, during these chronic stresses or during aging, a uh, number of proteins are modified and these are largely the same proteins. So if you treat a cell over time here for five, seven, ten days with a small amount doses of paraquat in this case, you find an increase in, uh, I want to point it out here, in uh, lipofuscin, which is located in the lysosomes. No increase, almost no change in the free cytosolic lipofuscin protein aggregates that we were able to detect. First, we address the question whether this lipofuscin here in the lysosome needs the acidic pH of the lysosome to be formed. So we knock down with an SI RNA the ATPase, which is transporting the protons into the lysosome. And you can see also, also if you knock down uh, this ATPase, so this proton, you, you don't have the acidic pH anymore in the lysosomes, you have still uh, some or the same amount of lipofuscin in, in the lysosomes. So, and no free floating lipofuscin in the, in the cytosol. So, somehow the acidic pH is not really needed for the production of the lipofuscin. Next question is whether the lipofuscin is really formed in the lysosomes, within the lysosome, or it's formed before and transported into the lysosome. And we used here an ATG5 uh, knockout cell line, a mice embryonic cell line, and also SE and a knockdowns for the ATG5. And we could clearly show in these mice uh, um, embryonic fibroblasts that again, the stress induces and the control induces some lipofuscin in the lysosomes, no free floating li uh, lipofuscin in the cytosol. If you have the knockdown cells, no lipofuscin in the lysosomes, but all in the cytosome. So obviously, the autophagy or the macroautophagy is the major mechanism which is transporting lipofuscin and protein aggregates into the lysosomes. The question is, why does it happen? Why do, do we need to 
transfer, it's an active transfer, macroautophagy requires energy. Why do we need this waste material to be transported into the lysosomes? The question is simple, because if you block macrophagy, block the transport of the proteins into, uh, the protein aggregates into the lysosomes, the cells, cells start to die. They have this macroautophagy as a protective mechanism in uh, fibroblasts and everything in a number of other cells. So that's something that macroautophagy is kind of a last line of defense against protein aggregation if the proteasome is not acting anymore because it's not degrading protein and it aggregates. So that's quite the line here, what I wanted to show you, the uh, oxidized aggregated proteins that are taken up into the lysosomes. However, what is interesting, what are the effects? What are the mechanism of the toxicity of these protein aggregates? And Kelvin showed you already some of the data which we had almost 10 years ago that part of the toxicity of these protein aggregates is related to protein, uh, proteasome inhibition. And I, there's a very old figure here. So lipofuscin or protein aggregates are able to block the activity of the proteasome. So this is one, act, uh, one way of the toxicity of these aggregates. So the other part, what we addressed here, is what happens if protein aggregates are blocking the proteasome. What is the consequence? Just without proteasome, it might be a cell still living there. And one of the initial work that we have done here is a very interesting one. It's done by Betty Katago. Uh, she is now in Istanbul with Nesrin kartal oyser that we could she, uh, show that if you have a massive amount of protein aggregates in a cell, or you block the proteasome by an inhibitor, you have a, the induction of certain genes. And since we investigated this time skin fibroblasts, we tested for MMP1 expression, which is one of the target genes of, or one of the functions of these fibroblastic cells. And we could show that proteasome uh, inhibition is leading to an activation of the AP1 system here, which is called by phosphorylation of June, and uh, most importantly, by a higher amount of June, of the, proteins, uh, of the protein, not only of the phosphorylated form, but really there is more protein. And this is one what Kelvin was already mentioned about NRF2. It's the same. We don't, we keep to forget that the proteasome is not only degrading oxidized proteins, but it's degrading a lot of functional proteins in the cell. And one of these proteins, which is known for 20 years already as a subset of the proteasome, is June. And by limiting the amount of this June protein, the June kinase under stresses is not able to induce uh, um, so much phosphorylation of June. And phosphorylated June is one of the AP1, part of the AP1 transcription factor, which is leading to um, uh, MMP1 transcription. If you have in this system uh, an inhibition of the proteasome by protein aggregates, you don't limit the amount of June and you have somehow a higher response of the June phosphorylation and AP1 uh, reaction in these cells. So proteasome inhibition, the blocking of the metabolic pathway, may actually induce or be part of the induction of several processes. That got us interested in it. So perhaps there are other genes also induced if you block the proteasome. And we raised the question about this. And I just before I come to the data, I just want to remind you of some data which Kelvin showed you already from our joint work that part of the stress response of the proteasome is that the 26S proteasome is falling apart. So you don't have any ubiquitin degrading activity or a lower ubiquitin degrading activity in the cell. Keeping this in mind, uh, yeah, these are the original data. As Kelvin mentioned already, the 26S proteasome, which are the dark columns here, it's going down in activity. And you have some increase in 20S uh, proteasome activity. And as you can see here, this is a relatively short time response. Within hours, it's gone. So, 
One of the consequences of this process is the accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins. And that's what I want just to point out. And we used such a model of stress induced or proteasomal inhibition by an inhibitor and tested on a microarray which genes are induced. And actually, these three genes here, the HSP27, HSP70, and H01, came up as the most induced. Typical stress responses, of course. Right? Uh, and we tested this, of course, also. These are protein levels here, and you see a dramatic induction of H01, some induction of H, uh, HSP27, and also HSP70, the inducible form, is highly regulated due to stress. The question is how? How can the inhibition of the proteasome induce uh, some stress response? I mean, you would expect at least the chaperone system to get upregulated due to a proteotoxic stress. And we looked through the literature, and we could find a nice mechanism. And I think it's really a beautiful work presented there. If you block the proteasome, and that's why I keep pointing it out, if you don't have the 20S proteasome, then you accumulate ubiquitinated proteins. And ubiquitinated proteins, these are polyubiquitinated proteins, stick around in a cell and bind to an enzyme known as histone deacetylase 6. This is a very special histone deacetylase because it doesn't deacetylate histones. It's the only cytosolic protein. There's one histone deacetylase which is in the cytosol. This is a number 6. And this is present in a complex normally and has a polyubiquitin recognizing moiety a domain. And upon binding of these polyubiquitinated proteins, this complex is uh, falling apart. And one of the proteins released by this is the heat shock factor 1, the transcription factor of the uh, uh, chaperone family. And this is spontaneously trimerizing. It's phosphorylated here, which is a pretty quick process, so really rate-limiting step of this whole cascade here is the liberation of the H, uh, heat shock factor 1 from the complex. And then it's a transcription factor for HSP27 and HSP70, the inducible form. But this is by no way the transcription factor for uh, heme oxygenase 1. And we came up with another mechanism, and I unfortunately don't have the time to show you the data, but it's published right now. Uh, in, yeah, that you find it in the literature, that by falling apart, this complex has a second function. And this is, of course, this is related to the activity of the histone deacetylase 6. It's really a deacetylase. And one of the substrates which is deacetylated for by this protein is P38, the MAP kinase. That is normally, it was, until then, it was not known that it's normally in an acetylated form in the cell or part of this is acetylated. By this enzyme, it's um, by HDEX6, it's deacetylated, it, and only then it can get phosphorylated. If it's phosphorylated, it's activating the NF2 pathway by phosphorylating NF2, which contributes further to the different story of the KEEP1 NF2 pathway Kelvin mentioned already. And NF2 in its phosphorylated uh, form can activate uh, histone D at, uh, sorry oxygenase 1. So actually, and that, that we think, and we are further investigating this, this complex here has multiple function in proteotoxic stress regulation. And more and more data coming up that uh, histone deacetylase 6 is also involved in macrophagy regulation. So it's obviously a key player in maintaining uh, protein homeostasis in cells. So, this brings up actually to the final scheme here that uh, proteins are oxidized. Even if you have these oxidized protein aggregates, they have still effects in the cell. They lead to proteasome inhibition through the accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins and by various mechanisms to stress responses of the cells in, uh, in order to compare and um, to fight the proteotoxic stress in a cell. So this leads me to my final scheme here, so that you have various stresses leading to oxidized unfolded proteins, which are either, deg either degraded by the proteasome or not degraded. And with time, 
independence of different concentration and different cellular factors like chaperones, for example, these aggregates are building up and growing in the cell. So we, we actually show that with time these protein aggregates are growing. It's a process involved in aging and eventually these protein aggregates influence the metabolism. The only way to prevent this is another process which is called macrophagy and the storage of some of these protein aggregates in the lysosomes. At the end of my talk, I was want to thank my former supervisor, longtime friend and collaborator, Kelvin Davis here, which introduced me to the proteolysis. A number of students from my lab, especially I want to mention Tobias Jung and Annika Hün, which they did a lot of the work I presented here. And actually, I've seen some people taking pictures of, uh, of these schemes. You can find them in a publication from Annika in one of the most important journals, which is now around, which is uh, the Redox Biology. And the beautiful thing about this is open access. You can download all this and use for your presentations, talks, and lectures. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> for this uh, interesting lecture that uh, uh, we discussed now, if there's a question. Yeah. So, very nice talk, Tom, and as usual. I, I, I really like your, your, shift, your presentation of these ubiquitinylated proteins accumulating, and it's worth maybe pointing out that a lot of people, if you're reading the literature, they did an experiment, they saw an accumulation of ubiquitin-related proteins, and that's evidence that proteins are being degraded by the ubiquitin proteasome system. In fact, it's circular logic. It's evidence, as you show, for accumulation, for non-degradation of those yeah. substrates. It's always annoyed me that people use the backward logic for that. I have this question for Kevin, but this is quite enough. Uh, <laughs> it's about this uh, link between proteasome and longevity. Because in those model organisms now that's been reported that uh, increased proteasome capacity whatsoever, uh, increased longevity. But in, in any cases that has been reported, those subunits that are overexpressed are rather 26S proteasome subunit than 20S proteasome mm -hmm. subunit. So and we've been advertising for 20S between the centrals. I, I think it really depends a little bit how you look at the system. I mean, if you, if you think 20S proteasome is some 1% of the cytosolic proteins. So I, I'm, I'm not believing that you have, in an accurate stress, so much upregulation of the proteasome. There's a bit, I'm not so, yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of contradiction how it works, NF2 or other transcription factor involved or modulating it. But uh, I think due to the, a major fact in aging, at least, is the accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins, and you find it in neurodegeneration, whatever, and the response to that would be an upregulation of the 19S fraction. Especially since uh, this 19S regulator becomes also more and more interesting in terms of interacting with chaperones, right? So it's not just, it seems to me at least, it's not just involved in proteolytic pathways but perhaps also in stabilizing proteins and doing a chaperone-like response. So it might be we, that we just look at the system from the site it was originally di discovered for, but it might have multiple functions. Is there any uh, activity of lipoblastin in the nucleus, the spectrum? <laughs> That that that's a great question, and I, I wish I could answer this because whenever we tried to locate protein aggregates, the nucleus was free. No, I, we we were not able to detect them in the nucleus. But on the other hand. We know that histones aggregate. They, they form lipophosphorescent with the time, but not inside the nucleus. And we don't know yet how these proteins are transported outside. 
that, that, uh, or these protein aggregates. So we, we really don't know. I think, or I believe that proteolysis of damaged proteins in the nucleus is quite special because it's quicker, it's a different time scale. Uh, if you have a bolus addition of hydrogen peroxide, you are activating the proteasome and you have normally a degradation within minutes, whereas in the cytosol it's more hours. So it's, it's like five, tenfold difference in time. So it might be that this is just a protective mechanism in order to prevent the accumulation of minimal damage already. So, but I don't know. I, I wish I could answer this. Yeah. <laughs> Tima, ah. <laughs> uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. And I was wondering uh, if uh, uh, you can conclude on how this uh, protein degradation can be modulated by micronutrients and uh, this autophagy process can be modulated by some um, special micronutrients. You can. I'm, I'm, I, I, yeah, I'd like to focus on the proteasome. I know a little bit more about this. Uh, yeah, you can activate the proteasome by a number of uh, micronutrients, like uh, these secondary plant metabolites. So it's not quite clear how it happens. It seems to be that some of them might <laughs> induce the proteasome by, in, via NRF2. It might play a role there, so because there's some response of the proteasome to NF2, and yeah, but and there are other means. So what is most interesting to us, so that this is re really, yeah, let, let's say a last-minute result from last week. Uh, the proteasome as an enzyme is methylated, and you can change the methylation status of the protein itself by adding uh, as an adenosyl homocysteine or something to your tissue culture. And it's changing the activity of the proteasome. We don't know how it works, so it's just new data. So, but I'm, I'm sure there is something more behind it.